Good evening. Welcome to the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts 2020 Open House. We will begin in just a minute. Uh, I just want to give a chance for all the guests to have opportunity to enter the virtual space. So we'll begin in just a minute. If you like, while we're waiting, um, please feel free to type a note into the chat box. Let us know where you're joining us from tonight. It's always a treat to know that our friends from near and far are with us. So nice to see people saying hello. Hello, friends from the West Coast and from the East Coast. This is great. I love seeing your messages. Well, a warm, warm welcome to everyone. We are delighted that you're here, whether it's the first time you are coming to the open house or if it's the third evening in a row that you're logging in to be with us tonight. Traditionally, all of us at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts look forward to a true highlight of our year, which is the open house. We can't, of course, welcome you in person to our 11,000 square foot historic building in the Rittenhouse neighborhood of Philadelphia tonight, but we are thrilled to bring this special gathering to you virtually. I am Stephanie Schwartz Bailey. I'm the Education Program Manager and Preservation Consultant at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, often referred to as CCAHA. CCAHA is a nonprofit institution serving cultural institutions, corporations, and private clients from across the nation. We conserve paper art and artifacts, books and photographs. We conduct planning and assessment activities to support long-term preservation efforts, offer housing, framing, and digital imaging. If I were, under usual circumstances, greeting you this evening at the top of the steps in the reception area at CCAHA, right there at the threshold to the laboratory, I would perhaps take your coat and offer you a printed map of the facilities through which you could wander tonight. I would send you to view in-progress conservation treatments and chat with staff at their benches and desks. Instead, I invite you to settle in comfortably at your laptop in your favorite chair or sofa. And with thanks for being here with us tonight in this virtual space, prompt you to listen for the next hour to a succession of presentations. So hear an introduction by the CCAHA board chairperson. Then meet our sponsors. Following that, please enjoy three pre-recorded video demonstrations by conservators. These videos last about seven to 10 minutes each, and they offer a close-up view of treatment challenges and successes in a 19th century, mid 19th century daguerreotype portrait, a bound expedition journal from 1853, and a collection of panoramic photographs. Lastly, you may participate in the live Q&A session with conservators moderated by a CCAHA board member. So lots of things to explore in the next hour together. 
Most of us have become very familiar with the Zoom platform at this time, but as a reminder, this is a Zoom webinar tonight, so your audio and your video are disabled. However, at the bottom of this screen is a bar with some active buttons for you to use. Uh, the first button down there on the bottom of your screen is the chat button. Please feel free to type your comments or concerns about technical troubleshooting into the chat box at any time. My colleague, Jason Hen, who is the manager of marketing and external affairs and the mastermind of this open house is monitoring the chat box uh, through the duration of the event tonight. Down at the bottom of the screen, you will also see a Q&A button, which you can use to pose questions directly to conservators. A CCAHA board member will be looking in the Q&A section for your questions to fuel conversation with the conservators who will be joining us live here immediately after we view the three video demonstrations. Lastly, then, at the top of your screen, you might like to set your view to speaker view, and that will allow your screen the maximum amount of space to view the videos. This event is being recorded. The link to each evening of the open house, in fact, will be available on CCAHA social media accounts in about a week. So please check back and you can view um, the, the recordings of the entire events. Also, I want to let you know that each video that will be presented tonight does have closed captioning. But last night we had a little bit of a technical glitch with the text delivery. So I want to let you know if something if we have that same problem tonight, um, please come back and view the recordings because we will make sure to fix the closed captioning in the recording so that you can view the entire text. I now welcome Larry Massaro, CCAHA board chairperson, to lead off our evening and introduce our generous sponsors. To you, Larry. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm Larry Massaro. I'm a member of the Conservation Center Board, and I'm here to extend a second welcome to all of our attendees, uh, this time on behalf of the full board of uh, this wonderful group. And I'm also here to uh, thank our very generous sponsors. We have five sponsors, uh, Diversified Storage Solutions, your part-time controller, Cheshire Law Group, and Innovative Document Imaging have all been um, very generous in supporting this virtual open house all for uh, these four nights. And our lead sponsor for all four nights is Atelier FAS Group. And I uh, have some information that may be of interest to a number of the uh, attendees about Atelier FAS. Um, F Atelier FAS Group is a full service, second generation fine art services company based in Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York, and currently expanding to Washington, DC. Atelier practices the highest standards of quality control and security in the safe transport and packing of fine arts and antiques and in crafting mu museum quality installations. Since our founding in 1986, we've excelled in handling complex installations for art museums, estates, historic houses, and ethnographic and archaeological repositories. Atelier's team of former museum and gallery registrars understand the importance of clear documentation and collection stewardship, expedient project management, and working within a client's budget and timeline. Atelier has 150,000 square feet of museum quality storage facilities on the East Coast, one in Philadelphia, the other in Newcastle, Delaware, with a satellite facility in New York, plus a 25,000 square foot fabrication shop for custom crating. Our 90 plus employees include 50 full-time art handlers and 12 art technicians. In addition, Atelier boasts a full fleet of 15 high security climate controlled air ride vehicles equipped with lift gates. A regional stronghold with international status, Atelier works directly with major cultural institutions, private collections and national and international galleries. We've had the privilege of handling some of the most prominent art relocations packing and installations of the century, 
including the renowned Barnes Foundation collection, the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and countless others. So our gratitude goes out to Atelier FAS for their sponsorship for this week's um, open house. And now I open it up to, uh, to the uh, sessions. Thank you, Larry, and to our sponsors for your support of and your partnership in CCAHA's mission to provide leadership and expertise in the preservation of cultural heritage. Many thanks. The evening now highlights three spectacular conservation treatments in a series of three pre recorded videos, followed then by a live Q&A with the conservators. Don't forget, while watching the videos that follow, to add your questions to the Q&A box. So to present the first project is photograph conservator Zachary Long. Hi, Zach. Hello. How are you doing? Um, please introduce to us the artifact with its delicate housing that you treated. So uh, we're gonna watch a, a video here and, and we're gonna be talking about uh, a whole plate daguerreotype of George Mifflin Dallas. Uh, the daguerreotype process was the first photographic process used for uh, portraiture. It was the first photographic process that made it out of the experimental phase. Uh, Daguerre had been working with uh, Nisiphore and Nieps to invent photography uh, for a little over a decade before they released the process in 1839. And so the types are, are really the, the earliest pictures that we see um, of, of, of people. Um, and they lasted for uh, a little over uh, around two decades uh, of their use. And so uh, this is a very nice portrait. It's a very large daguerreotype. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a pleasure to work on. Hello. My name is Zach Long. I'm a photograph conservator here at CCAHA. And today I'm going to present on this whole plate daguerreotype of George Mifflin Dallas that is in the collection of the Masonic Temple Library and Museum here in Philadelphia. George Mifflin Dallas was an important figure in the 19th century. He was a former Philadelphia mayor and he was a U.S. Vice President under James Polk in the 1840s. It is also believed that he might be the namesake of Dallas, Texas, because uh, he did have an influence in making that territory a state. Uh, this portrait was most likely taken in the, the 1850s. The daguerreotype process uh, was invented in 1839, and uh, George Mifflin Dallas uh, died in 1864. Um, but the plate, there are features of the plate uh, and his appearance that that most likely puts it in the 1850s. Now, uh, the reason this plate came into for treatment uh, is because the image was greatly obscured uh, by both uh, glass deterioration products on the glazing, dust that it accumulated on the plate surface and on both sides of the glazing, and then a white haze that was uh, partly obscuring the image. Uh, now, daguerreotype plates are, are very sensitive. Um, it's a polished silver plate and like all silver objects, it tarnishes very easily uh, if left exposed to the elements. And so they're typically put into cases that uh, try and keep the air out uh, as much as possible. Now, this daguerreotype is in a, in a slightly unusual case in that, in that it's uh, a, actually a small frame. Um, and it's stylistically similar to uh, an American daguerreotype case uh, but those are, are in more of a style of a small book. They open up and they have a cover. So this is like the lower half of one of those cases uh, with a small uh, hoop ringer uh, ring on the top for hanging. But uh, this may actually not be the original housing for this daguerreotype. Um, there is evidence uh, upon taking the plate out, there was evidence of a previous binding and this, this may have been uh, a later addition. Um, that is, that is unknown though. Uh, so the first step in the, the treatment was to remove the plate from uh, the housing, um, which was not particularly easy. Most daguerreotypes uh, can come out quite simply by using a suction extraction device to pull the whole plate package out the front of the case. 
um, this one was far too tight to be removed that way and so needed to be removed uh, from the back. Uh, upon opening, uh, having access to the bare plate, you could see that um, there was evidence of a previous binding that had been removed and there was uh, just several uh, strips of uh, binding tape that were left um, holding the plate uh, to the brass mat and uh, the glazing. So the, the treatment started by uh, removing those tapes uh, and then with the, the plate bare uh, and the glass separated, uh, both could be washed. Uh, and the washing of the plate was to remove the, that white haze, which is obscuring the image. And then the glass was cleaned and thankfully, after cleaning was in good enough shape that it could be reused. Um, given the style of the frame where you can see edge to edge on the glass uh, and every little uh, chip along the edge of the glass, um, it's nice to be able to reuse that, that gla glass to be able to keep the, uh, the look of the original. So we're seeing it uh, today just as it would have originally. Um, now, um, after the plate was cleaned and the glass was cleaned, uh, they needed to be rebound together. Uh, the plate was placed into a what's called a mylar Z-tray. It's a piece of plastic film which is bent around the plate to, uh, and that protects, keeps any tape off the plate itself, and it protects the plate, uh, the image side of the plate, from being abraded against the brass mat. Uh, so uh, with the glass cleaned, the plate cleaned, and the plate in the Z-tray, uh, all, all the elements were then rebound together using a special tape. Um, and then it could be reinserted back into the frame. Uh, the frame had shown quite a bit of wear and tear from the last 140 years uh, uh, around there. And so uh, there were some areas that were touched up and some fills that were made using uh, toned Japanese paper and in painting with watercolors. Uh, I'm in a darkened room right now, uh, as you may have noticed, to, to show this daguerreotype plate off um, as best as possible. Uh, because of their polished surface, daguerreotypes pick up a lot of reflections. And viewing under in a normal well-lit room would be almost impossible to see this image. Um, so with correct lighting in a darkened room with nothing across from it, um, it really starts to show off and show just how beautiful a plate this is and how... Uh, interesting it is to see photo documentation, uh, a photograph, a portrait of someone from the mid 19th century uh, with such detail, such resolution. Um, so I, I hope you've enjoyed seeing the, the plate. It was a, a pleasure to work with. Um, thank you. Thank you, Zach. I just love that we were able to intimately view that image of George Mifflin Dallas with you similarly beside it. What a beautiful way to celebrate the role a conservator plays in the long-term preservation of photographic portraiture. Thank you. To present the next project is book conservator Amber Hares. Hi, Amber. Hi. Um, I'm excited to share with you tonight a book that, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm excited to share with you tonight a book that records one of the earths of a government surveying journey um, through the American Southwest. Since the filming of the video, I've discovered an interesting science blog by a NASA computer scientist who last year retrace the surveyor's steps. Um, he has a series of posts about this track, which relates to the volume that I'll be sharing with you. Um, I will provide a link to his blog, as well as my favorite post in the chat box following our videos um, for any of you who are interested. Um, so thanks for coming and enjoy. This volume is a report of an expedition down the Zuni and Colorado rivers led by Captain Elsie Greaves. It belongs to the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, uh, which is our oldest, uh, our country's oldest natural sciences institution. And uh, lucky for us, it is here in Philadelphia, not too far from our lab. Um, they have such a spectacular collection and every object they bring us for treatment 
is just a real is a real gem, and this object is no different. Um, it recently arrived in our facility, so um, we are looking at it in a um, in an untreated state. To give you some background information on the contents of the book, um, it was a government-funded expedition um, in the Southwest that took place in 1853. So in September of that year, a party of about 20 folks um, with as many mules as they could procure for the expedition um, set out to determine the course and character of the rivers and the nature of the adjacent land. The first third of the volume, approximately first third to um, first half, um, is a group of reports, um, including numerous reports by S. Um, I think it's S. H. Woodhouse, um, and he is he served as both the naturalist and the surgeon for the journey. The last two thirds, um, last two thirds or second half of the volume, um, is a collection of plates. Um, that picture some of the Native Americans they encountered, as well as the birds, mammals, landscapes, reptiles, um, and fauna. Um, the plates are very lovely. Um, some of them are hand-colored, and the coloring and just the execution is, is pretty exquisite. According to the reports, um, which I've skimmed, uh, numerous species of bird, reptile, and fauna were discovered during the, ex during the expedition, um, some of which I assume are pictured in the volume. Um, interestingly, and I guess sadly, the naturalist gets bitten um, by a rattlesnake on the road, which renders his left hand um, unserviceable for the remainder of the trip. As for its conservation needs, just by watching me handle the volume, um, you can see some of its more significant um, condition issues. Um, in short, this last uh, third of the volume, the text block, um, has not only detached from um, this portion of the text block, but is also detached from the cover itself. Um, in addition to that, there are other splits in the text block. Um, you can sort of see, or maybe you can see, um, splits in the textbook here where the spine lining, the paper spine lining has deteriorated. Um, and in some of those locations, the sewing supports, which are a uh, recessed vegetable fiber cord, um, some of the sewing supports have also broken in those locations. Um, the other significant structural um, concern is the oversewing, which happens through the section of plates, um, the whole section of plates. Um, and this, as you could see as I was handling it, and you can sort of see now, um, this restricts the, the opening of the volume. Um, the other factors that are affecting that is just the, the thickness of the paper and just the lack of drape. But all those contribute to just not opening very well. Um, and this over sewing along the spine edge creates stress at, um, on each leaf, just in that area where it has to flex, but overall to the volume, it creates stress, which is why um, the volume is in the condition that it is in right now. To address these issues, the front portion of the text block that's still attached to the cover will be released, and then the whole volume will be disbound. Um, disbinding will include releasing the spine, the paper spine lining, um, and then also the adhesive beneath it, and then cutting the sewing threads. Um, once it's been disbound, the existing spine folds will be examined to see if they're vulnerable um, and where they are, they will be mended with a mulberry paper and a wheat starch paste. And then the single leaf plates will be paired up, um, making a basically hinged with a mulberry paper, making a spine fold. Um, that way when I re-sew the volume, I can re-sew through the spine fold instead of the margin edge, which will um, facilitate a better and safer opening. Um, all of the material that is added, all the mulberry paper that is added during the pairing of the plates um, will add dimension to um, the text block, basically make it thicker. Um, so it won't be able to fit in its original cover as it is now. Um, so to accommodate that thickness, the spine will be released from the cover boards. Um, the cover boards will then be attached to the, the sewn text block using the new sewing supports. And then along the spine edge, the covering leather will be lifted. Um, a cotton textile will be inserted from the inside, from the front to the back, basically creating a new spine. 
Um, and then after that is done, the original leather will be reattached to that new reback, um, to the new spine. Um, so there are other treatment steps that will be taken, but these are the major components of the treatment strategy. Um, in the end, the text block will, be, um, will become one unit again, and it will be reunited with its cover, um, and it will be in good working order to be safely handled and accessed once again. Thank you, Amber. It's really fascinating to observe how the historic sewing and the binding on a volume is really a critical consideration to the conservation treatment overall. Thanks very much. Our last featured project of the evening is presented by senior photograph conservator, Barbara Lemon. Hi, Barb. Hi, Stephanie. Please introduce your research and treatment of panoramic photographs, which are common in collections, I know, but often challenging to handle and house. Okay, tonight I'm sharing a fun example of the type of comprehensive soup to nuts project that CCA can offer you. Uh, we work with the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame and Museum of the American Cowboy on their successful Save America's Treasures grant application. It will enable CCHA to treat, digitize, and house 121 photographs for them, um, enabling them to be used for research and exhibition, and including um, revealing the 70 images that were tightly rolled. Megan Winterfeld, Exhibitions and Collections Coordinator, is attending tonight, and she can help me answer your questions. Um, I want to share that today I found a Philly connection to rodeo history. Uh, rodeo Ben Lichtenstein dressed many of mo the movie stars and regular cowboys in their finest Western gear from his tailor shop in Philadelphia. Based on the needs of his clients, he then created the Wrangler lines of, line of jeans for the Bluebell Corporation. He closed his store on Broad Street in 1983 when he was 88. A longer version of the following video will be available on YouTube um, if you crave more detail on the preservation of panoramas, including uh, possible housing formats. And now to the video. Welcome to our open house. Um, I'm going to be talking about panoramas today. Uh, the inspiration was two large projects that we currently have at the Conservation Center, but also um, most of you with photographic collections will have some panoramas. They're really common format. Um, in addition, everybody finds them really fascinating. So I was going to start out talking a little bit about typical images and some of the, a little bit about the panoramic camera. So you tend to see panoramic images of groups, um, military groups, school groups, family reunions. I have one of the Ham family with um, my mom as a little girl from 1946 and, and the, the matriarch in the middle. Um, so they might be, you know, banquet scenes are fairly common. Outdoor scenes are less common. It tends to be groups big events. Um, the two projects that we have in-house are from the Rolvag Library at St. Olaf College and from the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame and Museum of the American Cowboy. Um, both of them sent us large groups of panoramas that were inaccessible. They wanted to make them partly because they were rolled. Um, they wanted to make them accessible for research and all the objects needed some minor to major treatment before that was possible. Um, so we, would, we were going to be treating them, and then they were going to be digitized by us, rehoused, sent back to the um, institution where they could store them safely, make them accessible to researchers both in person and online. So the panoramas were made from the beginning of photography. People combined single images before they had panoramic cam cameras to um, generally for landscapes. Um, but then fairly early on, people created uh, panoramic um, cameras and plates. There were daguerreotype plates that were used for panoramic scenes. The circuit camera was a mechanized camera that would allow you to do a long extended scene like this. I mean, it was possible to do a panorama with a, just an extra wide um, lens like this. This is probably taken with a Kodak banquet camera and it is a banquet scene, hence the name. Um, but these really long ones, whether they were a smaller format, a wider, um, super long, I mean, we've had, we've had, I've seen them that are eight feet long. 
were done with a camera. The common brand name was called a circuit camera, C-I-R-K-U-T. That was well um, most popular in like about 1904 to 1940 in the U.S. It was a mechanized camera that rotated to take in the entire scene. And inside the camera, the film was, um, the negative was rolled and it was rotated at the same speed as the camera. Um, so one of the interesting things is you get some optical effects, like if you take something with a really, a, a wide image with a lens that's narrow, you get distortion at the ends. To avoid that, they would have to have the group actually curved for, like in this case, for this group to look straight and kind of an equal distance from the viewer, they actually had to be situated in a curved formation. And that's one of the reasons. So they look straight and flat, but the background has this kind of wavy aspect. Same here. This group looks like it's in a straight line, but actually in a curved line, so that uh, the soldiers were all equidistant from the camera, and that gives you the curvature background. Um, outdoor scenes were less common. This is one from the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame that's just kind of got a, a fantastic kind of Roman gladiatorial um, <laughs> um, essence to it. Uh, so what you see is at this end, there's um, Homer Holcomb, who was a, a, a inducted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame in 1979. And he was worked for 30 years as a, a, a rodeo clown and bull rider. And here he is at the other end. So it was possible after the camera had moved away from where you were standing to run around behind the camera and appear at both ends of the image. So this is a really fun thing to see. These are just, these are just terrific images. We really enjoyed having them here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the problems with them, how to deal with rolled photographs, and, uh, and uh, what, we've, what we've learned and hope to learn from them. One of the consequences of these having these very long prints is that they often come to you or you find them in your collection like this, rolled up. So roll panoramas, what, what to do with them, is one of the questions that I get most often from uh, collections managers, um, archivists, curators. So I was going to talk a little bit about that. I mean, you can just imagine, they were just, we used to say that they naturally rolled themselves up this way because you often see a little bit of curl in a silver gelatin print. And almost all the prints that are panoramas that we see are um, silver gelatin, developed out photographs, black and white images, um, that they kind of rolled themselves up. But really, they were just rolled from the start and stored this way because it was convenient. But also, the negatives were rolled up and stored because they were just so large. Um, there's really nothing wrong with the storage method. What the problem is if things get um, crushed. So. I have, I have come into collections and found things stored like this is perfectly fine. They're, um, the panoramas are pretty um, stable in the vertical orientation. You know, if they're not severely damaged, just wrap them with a little bit of paper, put them vertically in a box. If you want to, you can tie them with a little tool tape. Also having them down um, stored horizontally in a box is just fine. What you want to avoid is, is any, them being crushed or weighed on top. Because what happens is they generally start out in good condition. You know, photographic paper is really flexible and strong and good quality. But over time, you often see some deterioration occur, especially if the environment isn't good. And they might get darker like this. The paper might become brittle. You would see this is broken. There's some big losses on it or other kinds of problems take place. Um, this one's had uh, been attacked by some kind of pest, rodent. Um, other, other things you might see in your collection is, is tears that happen at the edge or people have um, repaired them, or attempted to repair them with tape. Uh, um, dirt on the outside, exposed areas or on the inside. Um, so really, housing is always a good idea because it protects things from the environment and from dirt and from handling. And a lot of the problems with these panoramas when you find them is from handling because people want to see what's inside. And I totally understand this is not often enough information to classify an object or know if you want to invest time. If you do have panoramas that are in good condition, it may be possible to scroll them and look inside. This is a panorama from our study collection, not a client's object. World War I era military camp photo, $1.
So I know that this one doesn't have any, any damages. It's not super brittle. So I'm going to gently scroll it with gloves on to protect it from finger oils and salts. And I can just take a peek at the image. And sometimes, you know, you can read the title that's printed in the image and that can be very helpful for research or you can then decide whether it's an image that you want to invest in for conservation treatment. So this one's quite long. Oh, and there's a crack in it. And these have all been humidified, which is what we do to relax the print so that we can open it up and dry it flat. And you can see some of the damages that are evident. This one was, has severe cracks in it and tears at the ends. So it's likely that this one was either um, pressed or when it was rolled up or someone tried to unroll it and has made um, breaks in the gelatin that we'll have to treat. This one's got a, a large loss that occurred at some point, whether when it was rolled or prior to that. And this one has um, had some big tears that someone has uh, repaired a long time ago with uh, pressure sensitive tape. I've been showing you a lot of the typical damages, problems that we see with roll panoramas, so now I was going to talk about how we would address those with treatment. Um, it, so you typically see some dirt on them and that we would both on the, the molten emulsion and on the the back side so we would surface clean those. If it's really embedded grime or there's accretions, we'll address that, but mostly we're just um, have to do kind of light dusting and get off the lower surface soil. The next stage is if the gelatin emulsion is damaged, which it often is at the edge, just kind of bumped or there's tears or um, cracks, you often get loose areas, flaking areas of the gelatin and we need to consolidate that and reattach those flakes so that we don't lose them and lose information. Um, so we've addressed kind of the, that emulsion layer in the image, and then we will deal with the structural issues, which tend to be tears, uh, cracks, creases. Showed you some that were where the, the roll was crushed in that or, or opened to, um, too far, and it just breaks the emulsion, and that kind of cre crease or crack you can see on the back. If you can see right here with my, my raking LED light. Uh, we need to bring this back into plane so that we can see the image clearly and we can um, store it safely. There's also humidification flattening. I should say that that is one of the first stages so that we can unroll the panorama. And we've got a stop motion video that you're going to be seeing after this that will um, show you the progress on a, on a group of panoramas. So we unroll it, do the surface cleaning, stabilize the um, emulsion, then we deal with the physical damages like mending the tears, and we're spending a lot of our time on these bringing into plane and reinforcing all of those tears and, and creases. So that's, I thought I would show you that. Um, it's because one of the things we're, we're spending a lot of our time on, and also we're using, this is Zach Long and I, of what is called a remoistable tissue, which has really become very popular in both paper and photograph conservation. It's um, photo safe adhesive, very stable, um, can be reactivated with water, ethanol, or a mix of solvents. It's called Clucel G. It's applied to a piece of mylar, and then a mulberry tissue is put on top. It's dried, and then you can cut strips or any shape you want, basically. Um, you can use, you can actually uh, lay this on top of an object and use a light table. You can trace losses if you need to reinforce them, but this can be used for mending or reinforcing. Uh, it's got, so it's got that thin dry layer of adhesive on the back and you can reactivate that and make it tacky again by using, like I said, water, ethanol, or a mix of solvents. I like to use a mix called a one-to-one. -one. So I need to take my strip find a piece that's the proper length for the grease crack. And uh, by applying this to the back, we give added strength to that area, but also um, there's a way to apply it so that it, it pulls that area into plane. And that's one of the things that we're particularly looking for.
Thank you, Barb. It was just delightful to look in the bird's eye view at those panoramic photos with you. Your, your presentation overall really also lets us know how important storage and housing are to long-term preservation of these oversized artifacts. Thank you so much. We now are going to conclude the evening with a live session which gathers Zach, Amber, and Barb back into the webinar. I hope you have all entered into the Q&A box some questions or some brief talking points for Zach, Amber, and Barb to address. To read your questions and to moderate the discussion, Ellen Cunningham Krupa joins us. Hi, Ellen. Ellen is the Associate Director of Preservation and Conservation at the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And she has been an active practitioner, educator, and consultant in the field of cultural heritage preservation for over 30 years. It's so lovely to see you tonight, Ellen. Thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to be with you, Stephanie, and with our wonderful audience. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to moderate this wonderful group of conservator talks tonight. Um, we've had a number of questions come in, and I think I'll just take them in order. Um, the first question is for um, Zach. What was the size of the daguerreotype that you treated? No, oh, it was the plate itself was six and a half inches by eight and a half inches. It's a, a standard size. It's called whole plate, and then smaller plates are, are usually um, will be like a quarter plate, six plate, ninth plate. So it's all based on that one standard size of the whole plate. Zach, I'd like myself just to follow on to, to the, this question for you. Um, is it unusual that a daguerreotype is so tight in its case? And what sort of, what did that convey to you, um, it being tight? Or did it convey anything to you about its provenance? Uh, no, it was, it was an unusual frame. I mean, daguerreotypes are, French daguerreotypes in particular are frequently framed, but in a very different style. Um, and so this housing, this little frame had more in, stylistically more in common with um, frames that were later used as like ambrotypes and, and later photographic processes. Um, and it may be a replacement, it's unclear. There's not enough of them around that anyone's really done clear research on it. Um, so it may have been um, tight because it, the wood warped uh, and it kind of pinched in on it or it may have been that it was designed so that it wouldn't kind of fall off the front. And so it was intentionally tapered in a little bit on the, on the, the front edges, like a, a slight bevel. Um, so in case it was knocked, it didn't just drop out. Um, and the, the whole back of it was glued up. All the, the wood was glued in place. And then there was um, uh, a backing sheet glued on top of that. Um, so it was, it was quite, lab quite laborious to get, get the plate out. <laughs> Quite a production. <laughs> well, it's a fascinating treatment. We have a, a number of daguerreotypes at the Harry Ransom Center too, and they're, each one of them are so unique. It's yes. lovely to hear about your treatment. And we also have an, a question from uh, an anonymous attendee for Amber. What happened to the person who was bitten by the rattlesnake? Do we know? Amber, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so from what I gathered from the um, skimming the reports, um, treatment included lancing and sucking the wound, um, and then included pouring over, um, pouring directly on the wound, whiskey and ammonia, and then also pouring that down the throat. So he also drank ammonia and drank whiskey. Um, he did survive and he also, it sounds like the, um, the, he did regain, uh, feeling back in his hand, I think a month or so after the expedition, but I put a link in the chat, um, because one of the things I discovered, um, on that blog I refer to is that the, uh, Woodhouse, all his, he kept journals whenever he traveled. And um, one of the, or the collection of journals that he has are all, they're at the academy as well. 
And the journal that he kept while he was on this expedition, he drew a sketch of his finger, I think seven days or so after it was bit. So there's, there's um, on the blog, there's an illustration that he drew, which is pretty gnarly, his finger. Um, but anyway, so check that out if you're interested more about the snake bite. That's fascinating. I, I, the, the benefit of being a conservator is how much you get to see and learn along the way, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I have a little bit of a follow on question for you, Amber. You know, it's sure. also a very difficult decision for a book conservator to disbind a book. And um, that's seen as a, you know, a more advanced um, invasive treatment these days. So it would be, I think it'd be interesting to all of us to hear how, what was your thought process? How did you walk through um, your thinking about the need to take apart this book and, and give it a, a more suitable um, binding structure? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's various uh, levels of treatment, um, degrees of intervention that we carry out. Um, like you said, um, each valve object has uh, different needs. And then in addition to its needs, we're also considering the vision of the caretaker. Um, how the object is going to be used, as well as, you know, factors like time and money also uh, play a role. Um, so there's definitely a lot of factors that go into considering that you consider when you're designing a treatment plan. For this object, um, because the integrity of the structure, structure had already deteriorated, the, the integrity of the text block, um, it gives us an opportunity to kind of reconsider how it was put together. Um, in this case, there's the two iterations of sewing. There is the over sewing, which was highlighted in the video, um, which is through the margin edge. And then there's also the sewing over um, uh, recessed quartz, and that's through the fold. And that facilitates a safer and easier opening. Um, so this was a scenario where, you know, since the book had sort of fallen apart, and it's, it's giving you an opportunity to kind of think, well, let's just be, let's use where you're sewing through the fold, but not redo the sewing through the spine margin. Um, we might be having a different conversation if it came to us for other treatment issues. And even though it had it over sewing, it was still intact. And we would, you know, sort of respect that it was, it, it was what it was. Um, but in this case, our chief goals are both to keep it to keep it in its original format, so keep it as a bound book. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to make it so the plates are more accessible. So this is this is the direction that allows that to happen. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's I love sure. to, to hear you talk about your treatment. It takes many years of practice and, and, and well, it takes many years of, of gaining knowledge and skills and practicing them and mentally practicing them in order to be facile with that kind of decision-making process. It's complex. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And every, every object is different, right? So it's, it's you're dealing with a lot of factors and the structures are different. So it's, it definitely is a case by case. Um, a lot of thought goes into it. Okay. Well, um, I'm gonna move over to uh, Barbara Lemon. Uh, Barbara. I'd like to know, and I bet a lot of people tonight would like to know, what makes your work, what excites you about your work at the Conservation Center, uh, the things that walk in the door, what, what makes your day tick? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's an easy question to answer, Ellen. I thought you were going to give me a, ask a detail about panoramic <laughs> treatment. I mean, we have see such a wide range of materials and images, and we, um, if we're lucky, we get to learn the history of the piece. Um, and assist the client with um, figuring out what their goals are, what's possible for the object. And like I said, when we're able to take an object from a client and then give it back to them in a condition that they can better appreciate it, better uh, offer better access, um, and it's it's more stable. I really like that. And and I just I just love photographs. I just love the images of all types. That's one of the perks of this job. Thanks, Barb. I know that, that all of y'all enjoy working with your clients so much. And, um, and that's, that's always a pleasure, I think, is meeting, meeting new people, um, learning about their collections and, and serving their needs. Um, we have a, a question, let's see, from Kurt Widener. Um, this is for you, Zach. Is there a difference between a daguerreotype and a tintype? And how would you conserve a tintype if it is different from a daguerreotype? 
Yes, they are different. Tin types are a later photographic process. It's a wet plate process that uses uh, uh, collodion as a binder um, and that has the silver in the collodion. Um, and so they frequently have the issue of uh, flaking is a really common problem with tin types and corrosion. So they're on a metal support, uh, a steel, steel support, and that will, will corrode. Um, and then you start to get flaking of the upper layers on top of that off. Um, and so, yeah, very, very different. Uh, they, the tin type came out a couple decades after the daguerreotype. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. Um, let's see. Um, ah, Ruthie has a question for you, Zach, as well. Um, though Barbara, pitch in. I think you've done plenty of this too. Um, how are the glass and the plate cleaned when you're working on a daguerreotype? What is the process? Uh, the, the glass is cleaned fairly simply. Um, with uh, or at, it's cleaned after it's removed from the plate, um, but then it's uh, just water and uh, ethanol uh, is mainly what's used. Um, try not to use uh, anything more than that. That usually works um, to clean up the glass. Um, if it's if it, that doesn't work, the way the glass is deteriorated um, beyond salvage, um, or there's a random residue that needs to come off with a different solvent. Uh, the plates themselves, uh, that's, uh, it, that depends. It depends on, on what the, the issue you're trying to correct is. Um, and so it can vary from simple water baths to electro cleaning. Um, it, it really depends on what you're trying to correct. Yeah. Thank you. Barb, I think um, some of our viewers may be interested in knowing how many types of photographic processes um, there are. I mean, there's so many. And, and can you just give a ballpark figure for how many processes you've seen come through the center over the years? That's a toughie. You've got to help with that, Zach. I, was I would say easily we've seen 40 or 50 types of processes if you include negatives and prints um, and then case photographs and different formats like stereo views. But there are there are literally hundreds of photographic processes. Um, starting the of photography, you made your own materials. So there's all those variations that occurred between practitioners and as they were, every improvement is some can sort be a, Sometimes it's a different process. It's different enough as it went along. And then you can think in the modern era, well, until people discontinued making a lot of photographic papers and, and films, which every manufacturer might have dozens of surfaces for even just black and white prints. So um, it, it does help to be curious. <laughs> what, exactly. What <laughs> I've always really, I, I, I continue to fully admire photo conservators and the vast amount of knowledge you have to have and just to identify um, what the print is. And especially now too with digital prints, um, such a complex issue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Barb. Yeah. Um, we're gonna get close to, we're six, it's about 626 on my computer, but I think we have time to answer a few more questions that have come through. Um, so Amber, um, I'm going to hit, throw you a double question here. Um, what was the approximate time to, that you took to restore the, the Zuni survey report? And if possible, what was the cost of that project? And then um, in addition to that, um, can you tell us anything about the artists um, who did the book's illustrations? Hmm. Um, well, to answer the first question, um, each project is estimated based on the client's goals and how much time it's going to take. Um, in this situation, I don't, the book hasn't been treated yet. Um, I'd have to go back and double check, but I would say my guess would be that it's about a 30 to 40 hour treatment. Um, and of course, that's not, uh, it doesn't happen in, you know, two weeks span, you kind of break it up you're dealing with other projects and then also you know considering a lot of factors as you as you treat the object um i'm not i won't discuss the, the cost of, of this treatment 
um, on this forum. But if someone is interested in a treatment, of course, reach out to us and we can provide a, a cost estimate. Um, the artist, I, I don't know the exact artist. I know that the lithographs are, are signed. Um, is it, it's James Ackerman, um, which the address is in New York. Um, so I'm not exactly sure who the artist is, but in the front of the volume, there is a plate uh, with a manuscript ink where it says that um, S.W. Woodhouse, the naturalist that went on the trip, it says that the uh, plates are hand colored by him. Um, so that's that's the information that I have regarding the the um, the artist and the coloring of the plates. Well, that's fascinating. You know, you, you've learned a whole lot, Amber, about, about this book. I'm very impressed and, and intrigued. I'd love to see it up front and personal. Um, Zach, this is a question again about cleaning. Um, one of our uh, viewers asks, is a phosphoric acid or thiourea chemistry still used for cleaning daguerreotypes? No, it is not. It's not recommended because it'll leave, um, the chemistry can be fully removed and then it causes problems such as measles. Um, and so it ends up, while the plate may look good to begin with when you're first done, 10 years down the line, it starts to deteriorate the image in a way um, that's really bad. So there, there are better ways to clean it now. Um, it's not recommended. So don't do it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Zach. Um, we have one minute left. Um, I'm trying to look through all these questions to make sure I got them. I think I got all of the questions that came through. Um, apologies to anyone if I missed you. Um, so let me think. I think we got it all. Great. This has yeah. been a really interesting evening full of so much medical advice and scientific <laughs> terminology. It's great. We've taken a different spin tonight. It's really fun. <laughs> thank you, Ellen. And Pleasure. thank you, Barb and Zach and Amber. Uh, learning by he through hearing through your voices and taking a look at the hand skills that you use on these treatments. It's been really special. Um, for me, I've really missed peeking over your shoulder and seeing what you're doing on your treatments these past few months while I've been working from home. And for our whole audience, we share your enthusiasm and we celebrate with you the significance of preserving our common cultural heritage. Thank you all. So this concludes the evening's presentations. I do wanna say thank you again to our 2020 Open House sponsors. Atelier, your part-time controller, Diversified Storage Solutions, Innovative Document Imaging, and the Cheshire Law Group. Thank you for your support and helping us produce this open house and connect with our audience in this really engaging and exciting way. So before we depart this virtual space tonight, I wanna to remind everyone that we are going to be here again for another final presentation tomorrow. Same time, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Same Zoom link, um, but different presentations. <laughs> um, you'll be treated tomorrow to a presentation on Lem Hawkins's confession lobby card from 1935, which belongs to a private client. And there is a fascinating reveal there as to how conservation and historical research can be intertwined. And also tomorrow evening, we will feature how educational programming at CCAHA contributes to the field overall during an interview with a diversity colloquium advisory panel member. So please join us again tomorrow. Until then, be well and good night. Right.